Hello, my name is Dr. Marcia Braden. I'm here to talk about supporting adults with Fragile X Syndrome. Supporting adults with Fragile X Syndrome is really a difficult thing to talk about because in the long run, what we're really offering up here are ways that we can help them become independent. Oftentimes, I'm asked the question, how much independence is really fair to expect? And parents oftentimes have lived with this individual for many years and raised them up in a dependent sort of uh, relationship. And letting them be independent is, is very difficult, as it is with typically developing individuals. They ask, how can I watch my child struggle? Or people who work in group facilities want to know what's really fair in terms of consumers and residents and how they struggle to gain that independence. Also looking at what's the scale, how do you reconcile the difference between someone who uh, has Fragile X syndrome and then someone who's typically developing. That looks real different in, in the big picture and accessing their communities. Often I'm asked if my child or my resident has very few interests and I can pleasure him or her by helping out and supporting in normal activities, what can that look like for them and how do I help them compensate for their deficits? And then again, why? Why do we need to structure environments? Why is it so important for them to live in structure all of the time when they go to work or when they're at a residential uh, community activity that's structured? Shouldn't there be a time that they can sort of be on their own and less structured? Then also, when we're scheduling um, with limited personnel in a facility, how in the world do we staff for all the structures during the day? So I hope that I can share with you some ideas related to that structure and why it's so important for these individuals to gain their independence. Do we know if we're really preparing our child for the life and the life after you're gone? And parents, this is a hard one to discuss. It's hard for all of us to discuss, but when we have a child who is affected with Fragile X Syndrome, it oftentimes is, is extremely difficult. Parents start asking this question really too late. <laughs> oftentimes they're really too old to prepare the child. And so my hope is that this support for an adult comes early and that you will recognize those times when you can prepare your child to be more independent as they progress and develop. When the child is an adult and has been supported to be independent, so many more opportunities open up. And oftentimes parents will say, well, my child is too low functioning. He'll never be that independent. And I guess I take issue with that because I've been able to watch that evolve. And I've been able to watch individuals who started out with very few skills, but through the process, able to acquire lots of skills and then gain their independence. We know that research tells us that independence really creates opportunities in jobs, in community settings, and in social settings. It opens doors for those individuals with Fragile X Syndrome. Employers value that independence and even more than cognitive levels or speed or skill competence. This is an important thing to consider because employers are able to help uh, individuals, but they can't be there constantly. The job coaching ends at a certain point and the one-to-one -one support is no longer available. So they will be able to handle uh, a worker who might work slowly and they're able to accommodate for that, but they're not able to provide that one-to-one -one intervention or that one-to-one -one help that someone who isn't independent needs. Again, the adult sometimes is prompt dependent. And when we've not provided opportunities to fade out the prompting, they can become very dependent and again, kind of get morphed into that learned helplessness model that many of us are understanding of.
Being independent really feels good. And I think that's the most important part of this slide, that those individuals who are independent and who can develop that independence feel so good about themselves accomplishing things without help and support. And as I say this to you, I want parents, caregivers, anyone connected with an adult with Fragile X Syndrome to understand that as you prepare them for independence, you are providing them with a wonderful gift. Independence again opens doors. If we're structured and consistent and our expectations are the same, we will help them build skills. We know that these individuals thrive on routines and predictability. So that structure is very important for them to learn the routine and to be motivated by the routine. The routine actually serves as the one-to-one, -one, the person that is, is guiding and correcting them. The routine is something that they can habituate and they can learn to be totally independent when they follow that routine. It gives them richer living and work experiences if they're independent. They're more valued. People want them to work for them if they're more independent. And parents, we need to give up that personal fear that you're the only person that can really safeguard or help protect this person with Fragile X Syndrome. And you sort of need to have the confidence and the courage to turn loose and to let those natural supports start to take form. What do we really consider successful uh, when we're looking at independence and what kind of support in a home, whether it's your child living with you as an adult or in a residential facility or in a, a host home or something in the community, we know that these things are important to provide to gain the independence. We need to find capabilities in these individuals and capitalize on them. That allows them to succeed quickly. It allows them to pull from that skill set in a way that they're able to be more independent. Encourage that time away from you or encourage that time in the community with other people or family members to gain access to those variety of activities independently and without a parent there. Repeat those activities until they become habituated because we know that anything that's habituated becomes familiar and that routine is very important in terms of those individuals being able to stand alone, be independent and advocate for themselves. We also know that relationships outside the family are very important. Having them participate in a group that's away from the family structure and something that may be related to Special Olympics or volunteering or a community outing in a group, those things will foster that relationship in a way that allows you as a parent to pull back. Encourage the grooming and the personal hygiene. That truly is a way to build that independence because they will be more accepted. People will look at them and develop a relationship with them that is separate from you. And it also breeds that feeling of independence and competence. Encourage those age-appropriate dress and interest and activities. When we see an individual with Fragile X who's an adult, who's older, and their dress looks to be very immature, we may in fact sort of deem them as less competent and less able. We also want the home or the place where they live to be structured and very predictable. So things being put in certain order so that they can find them independently, not requiring you or a prompt from anyone to find their shirt that they're wearing that day or to find their lunch that they're taking with them that day. If things are structured and in a place that's the same all the time, those individuals with Fragile X Syndrome as adults will be able to access that they need to go to work and to participate in the community. Be sure that you have some place at home where they can develop those sensory breaks and help teach that regulation modulation they need to be able to have access. 
uh, to those breaks, and we need to honor those when they ask for them. All of that leads to them independently regulating and modulating. That's a crucial step in their becoming independent. We need leisure sites and expectations, what they can really do um, during their downtime. These individuals tend to like the social time with others, but there's going to be times where they need to be able to provide uh, their own independent leisure skills. They need to be able to engage in those things that are on their own or something that they can do by themselves. And a strong recommendation is to limit the time on screens. Replace that with things like sports, physical activities, hobbies. A lot of them love to cook, setting up small jobs, even cooperative jobs and tasks in the home or group home environment would be helpful. So what do we do about the neurobiology of these individuals? We know that Fragile X is related to a specific gene, and we know that the result of that gene and what goes on in their brain causes them to have developmental delays. We know that it also contributes to poor sleeping, delayed toileting, problems with eating and obsessions with food, their grooming and hygiene, their motor delays, a lot of times their behavior, their anxiety and hyperarousal, and social skills. It's important to provide a consistent bedtime, and this is something that you'll teach them so that they will develop that as part of their bedtime routine and habit. They will establish the bedtime routine that may include the grooming, may include a shower, may include a bath, they also may read a social story or go online and read something related to the news of the day or something that they experienced that day. We want them to have a quiet room so that they are able to lie down and calm and relax themselves. Sometimes we use a nightlight or a slow dimming device. These are available from some of the tech places like Sharper Image where you can actually find a lamp that you can set to a specific time. And as 15 to 20 minutes go by, the light dims until it's dark in the room. You might employ soothing music so that they can enjoy that and relax, but it also has to be on a timer so that it shuts down at a certain time. Some individuals access a sound machine, which allows them to relax uh, to some certain environmental sound. That is often helpful and sort of keeps those distractions uh, out from outside of the bedroom. Also, again, limit the electronics. Try to collect them at the end of the day. Put them on a charger, either with you as a parent or in an area where the residential um, facility is being monitored. When toileting is delayed, it becomes very debilitating, and it causes individuals with Fragile X syndrome to be less accepted. By the time they reach a certain age in their adults, independent toileting has been accomplished. But the problem seems to be that some adults still struggle with sensory issues related to cleaning themselves after a bowel movement. We think that's because they have sensory sensitivity to that area of the buttocks, and so in order for them to clean that area, we need to provide material that they can tolerate. Sometimes, if you provide those wipes that are wet or maybe softer, that's a way for them to learn to clean themselves. A strategy that we could employ is to schedule a time where we are actually assisting them with the wiping after a bowel movement. Again, this allows them to use wet wipes or other softer materials, but we want it scheduled in a time so that we constantly are working on this and that there's not a time where they in fact then become dirty. Allow those wet wipes, allow reinforcing, with other things that they may enjoy. Allow them to have a certain kind of underwear. Maybe it's something special that they can use that they want to keep clean. 
and then maybe introducing a fragrant soap or a gel so that that's something that they can experience as well. Eating becomes a major issue for these individuals, and it's been something that neurobiologically uh, has been there for a long time. Parents report with young children that they tend to stuff their mouths with food because the receptors in their mouth are not good enough to detect that there's food there or even to enjoy food unless it's completely full in their mouth. That becomes an issue because they tend to overeat. So again, many of the adults with Fragile X syndrome that are females or males become obese due to some of the stuffing, some of the food choices based on the sensitivity and sensory feedback of the food, the smell of the food. And then in addition, there's another neurobiological conundrum, and that's related to their low muscle tone. So they really don't like to engage in exercise. It's difficult for them to motor plan any exercise. Their stamina is limited. Their core is weak. And so all of that combined causes them oftentimes to become obese and overweight. Food also can become an obsession And really, that's the reason uh, that many of these people struggle so much with overeating. They're really obsessed with food. Chewing is something that they do at an early age. They often will chew their collar or even part of their clothing to calm themselves. And so we know that chewing is something that's calming. It's relaxing. And so when you like food and you're engaging in a lot of chewing of food, you're relaxing, but you're also overeating. So how do we structure things to try to improve this? I think it's really important at an early age to introduce different foods and a variety of food textures. By the time they're adults, if this has not been done, then it's necessary to continue to introduce those foods in a way that's going to be helpful for them to understand that we're really looking at a health issue and we're trying to keep them as healthy as possible. It's important to monitor those food choices and lots of incentives to try the new foods. These individuals that are fairly independent oftentimes will access vending machines will spend money on foods that are not healthy and be fine in in the group facility or in a facility where they live. We would want to monitor the food choices with incentives to try new foods. We know that those individuals that are more independent oftentimes have access to food or vending machines or fast food. That's really difficult to monitor because we want them in one way to be independent but in other ways then if they're accessing unhealthy foods, supplementing their diet, that's not helpful. We also know that they will lie about that and they will tend to become pretty defiant about allowing them to have their own food choices. We want to try to help them eat slowly because of the early stuffing when they were young, that really creates a bad habit of eating pretty quickly Um, We also worry about stuffing food and swallowing it because there's a choking issue there, and that becomes something that can become a health issue. We also understand that if they are becoming independent and eating in a group or eating out with other individuals, some of that stuffing and fast eating becomes obnoxious and becomes something that doesn't really adhere to normal table manners. When we talk about grooming and hygiene, it's really important to set the stage for an individual to be independent, but accepted as an adult who is independent. If they're asking for showers, um, that's okay. Some of them prefer showers to bathing. We know because of the sensory feedback, there are often problems with showering, with haircuts, with brushing their teeth, limited clothing choices because they like a certain fabric or they like sweats, things that are not tight-fitting or scratchy. That's difficult because in order for them to look the part, so to speak, in order for them to be clean and well-groomed so that they're accepted, they have to fight their own biology. 
and we need to help them and support them in that endeavor. Societal norms really do relate um, to looking clean. We like people who look clean and neat and tidy, and we also give them more opportunities. We unfortunately will size somebody up by the way they look, by the way they smell, by the way they're dressed. And so it'd be nice if we could change those norms at this point in time, that's not possible. And so individuals who are adults have to adhere to those societal norms. In order to promote good grooming and hygiene, we need to structure that into the routine. So we'll have schedules for showers, haircuts, and brushing their teeth. A lot of times dentists recommend the spin brush, but oftentimes we get feedback from individuals with Fragile X syndrome that the hypersensitivity in the mouth makes it very difficult to tolerate the spin brushing. And so sometimes we just need to have the manual toothbrush available in case that's an issue. Do they shower or do they bathe? Again, that's a personal choice. It depends on their sensory issues and how able they are to tolerate a shower head with water coming down on their body. Oftentimes, they prefer bathing. Using special shower gels um, may be also an incentive for them to be able to have an adult smell, um, maybe something that their siblings or people in their environment use would be another way for them to buy into the structure of good grooming and hygiene. And then also, we often try to build a relationship with a barber or a hairstylist because when we can explain those fears to those individuals, they can make it easier for the person with Fragile X to get a haircut. I've had parents tell me and even carers tell me that their job has been to get the individual to a barber and that there are episodes of behavioral excesses to avoid or escape going to the hairdresser or to the barber because the sensory issue is so huge and it's so uncomfortable for them to have anyone touching their head. These are the guys that tend not to like to wear caps or beanies or anything that's connected to their hair. So again, desensitizing that, maybe going and, and making a video of the shop or the barber shop, having the person that's going to cut their hair introduce themselves in the video, and then bringing the video back and showing them ahead of time so that you can prep them for that experience. Give them choices. This is so critical. When we know that they need to do grooming, we can give them a forced choice. Do they want to shower first? Or do they want to brush their teeth? Do they want to take a bath? Or do they want to shampoo their hair first? So again, those choices cut down on some of the fear that's created by us just forcing them to do certain things and not having a choice or a say. We can even give them a choice about what they wear. We can let them know that a t-shirt and soft sweats are okay, but they can only be worn on weekends. And when they're going to work or volunteering, they have to wear something different. This visual demonstrates a good way to promote hygiene and shampooing and showering. Because what's available here is a visual schedule of showering and shampooing the head and then moving the device over, the piece over, and going to the next body part to shower up and suds up in a way that your body looks the same as the visual. And as soon as that happens, then you can move the icon over and go to the next body part. This is just an example of a showering visual that one of the parents have used for many years with their son, and it's at the point now where he's independent enough to do a good job showering. One of the problems with this is that uh, it's really hard for those individuals to tolerate the sudsing and the soap on their skin, and so they take shortcuts, and they get in and out of the shower very quickly, and of course, that's not helpful to their grooming and hygiene. 
The motor delays are very difficult as well because many adults with Fragile X syndrome have had that low tone and low endurance for many years, and it affects their development. It predisposes them to having lots of difficulties with self-care, physical pursuits, and school activities. And so you get into this routine where something is very difficult because of the motor delays, and you're not exercising, and you're not maintaining a good lifestyle. It also keeps you from engaging in lots of sport activities, which is good for these individuals because they are so verbal and so social, and they enjoy being on teams and with other individuals. So I highly recommend Special Olympics. Many of the individuals that I see in therapy and have known through the years have been very successful with Special Olympic sports. These two individuals you can see have earned medals that bring them a great deal of pride. So in summary, I want to reiterate how important it is to be appropriate and to give appropriate supports in the environment and accommodate these individuals who are adults so that they can participate in work, in volunteering, and accessing their community. Encouraging that independence will pay big dividends in the long run. It will provide them great opportunities to enhance their daily living skills. And remember that independence will always open doors to them and they will be able to gain full access to their capabilities.